Thank you, Dr. Cabral, for your exposition of the governance uh, rules, regulations, and so on. Now, uh, as we observed, uh, com gov good governance is sine qua non for sustainability of any company. And then the issue of ethics, and again important, what is right and what is wrong, that must also be followed by the uh, team uh, governing any corporate uh, organization. We have listened from him uh, a long list of do's and don'ts. And uh, I assume that if the board members can follow them uh, meticulously, there would be at least an assurance that governance would be much better. However, the question of ethics still remains. And we have seen in the past quite a few big companies had to be closed, not because of good governance, but because of poor ethics. We have now Mr. Excuse me, Ramakrish Dr. L. Ramakrishnan, the distinguished professor of In Search Pune, India. Well, Dr. Ramakrishnan is a PhD on environmental management, a postgraduate, have a postgraduate diploma in ecology and environment, and is also a postdoctoral fellow from Department of Chemistry, Wayne State University in the USA. Uh, in addition, he has a PhD degree in molecular structure, MS in analytical and inorganic chemistry, and of course, a BS in chemistry. It's a unique combination of chemistry and environment. He has been an independent resource person of sustainability, corporate social responsibility, environmental management, OHNS management, energy management, and responsible supply chain management. He is also, he's also a distinguished professor and head of INSERT Center of Sustainability Management in Pune. Between 2000, uh, January 2009 and October 2009, uh, he was in charge of Regional Sustainability Coordinator, Philips Lighting, Asia Pacific Region. Then he had to report to the Vice President of Sustainability and Government Affairs. November 2008 onward, he is serving as Regional Project Team Leader, Extended Producer Responsibility. It's a joint project of Philips, Osram, and uh, Grant uh, Thornton, and other lamp manufacturers in Asia region. Between 2001 and 2008, he was Regional Environment Coordinator of Philips Lighting and Asia Pacific Region. And in the past, between 2004 and 2008, he served as a member of new sustainable business initiatives of Philips Lighting Holland. So we'll now listen from an expert who has traversed into chemistry, went into lighting industry, and finally in uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, uh, my colleagues on the dais and uh, my friends in front of me. Uh, I used to be a scientist once upon a time. I started as a research scientist. Now I ended up as an environmentalist or a sustainability expert. So, being a scientist, I never uh, believed in astrology. In, you know, people say certain things happen because of 
the star positions. Always I get a session after lunch. Wherever I go, after lunch, I started believing in astrology. Maybe some star in my horoscope has given me only the afternoon session, after, exactly after lunch. This is, a, this is a, maybe fifth or sixth time I'm doing this. Anyway, I, I wish I keep you a little awake. See, this is going to be a very short uh, presentation. Obviously, I will not be able to cover many of the issues which will be covered under this subject. Why it is imperative, why sustainability is imperative to economic growth. Uh, what I would do is I will try to give some examples, a few uh, subjects I try, try to touch upon. The rest I leave it uh, for the question and answer session. Uh, first, uh, as a broad outline, I will try to touch upon perceptions. What a government thinks of sustainability, what a business thinks of sustainability. And uh, what happens uh, because of economic and population growth in our region? What are the issues, environmental and social issues, which accompany this growth? What is imperative for the government? What is imperative for the business? And how do we go forward? Uh, this is going to be a sort of college. Maybe you may not get uh, probably a logical link between, you know, the first part and the second part or whatever it is. Please bear with me. Uh, I'm not going to read the paper. Paper can be read. It is already there. But I'll just try to explain to using these slides. What are the perceptions like? As far as the government is concerned, sustainability is nothing but preserving natural resources, maintaining clean air, water, and soil, maintaining social equity, and providing good living conditions while maintaining the desired economic growth. The very important thing is maintaining the desired economic growth, keeping all these things in mind, you know, keep preserving the natural resources, maintaining clean air, and uh, providing a good living condition to uh, the people. Whereas when it comes to business, it is achieving economic goals while caring for the environment and society. This is a triple bottom line approach where you try to say that we are going to achieve our goals in a sustainable way. That means when we achieve our goals, we also take care of the environmental issues as well as social issues. If we do not progress on all the three together, we are not going to be there tomorrow. That's the business uh, awareness or perception of this issue. Now, if you see the population growth in our region, it's quite, uh, quite high. I mean, I mean, economic growth, it's quite high. If you see, most of our countries have doubled their GDP in the last 10 years. In fact, Sri Lanka has tripled almost. Sri Lanka has been doing extremely well. Maybe it's because of the reference point. If you see the... GDP per capita, it's also quite high. Of course, it's not as comparable to the world uh, G average GDP, but it's quite uh, reasonable. If you see Bhutan, Bhutan is 6,500, it's quite high. Almost half of the world average. Maybe the lowest one is in Nepal, it is somewhere around 409. But if you see the growth of all these countries in our region, Bangladesh is 165.2. I'm talking about the decadal growth. I'm not talking about yearly growth. In the years between 2004 and 2013, Bangladesh's GDP has grown by 165.2, Bhutan 153.5, India 160.1, Maldives 113.8, Nepal 165.2, Pakistan 137.1, Sri Lanka 225.2, whereas the world growth in this decade was only 80.5. That means we have done extremely well with respect to GDP growth in this uh, decade. What does it mean? Anyway, we'll, I'll come to that after seeing the next slide. <clears throat> this growth has taken place mostly in the business area. In all these countries, the contribution to the GDP by agriculture has been coming down, both 
the service sector and industry sector put together as business is growing. If you see this one, almost about 80% in Bangladesh is from business. I mean, you will say around 60 to 80 in all these countries is from business, 20 to 30 or 20 to 25 is from agriculture. So there is a shift from agriculture to business and service related uh, uh, businesses. It has certain meaning when we say the economic growth, GDP is growing, also there is a shift towards industry and business. What it means is we are consuming more and more resources. When business grows, we are going to use more and more resources, natural resources. We are also going to emit more and more polluting, pollutants. We are going to discharge more and more uh, pollutants through water. We are going to generate more and more waste. Nothing comes from nowhere. It has to go somewhere. You know, we are taking everything from this earth, and all these things we generate uh, are going to going back to the earth. So we are going to have more problems because of more and more consumption and more and more waste generation. If we do not address these issues, our economic growth can be affected over a period of time. <clears throat> Added to that, we have this growth. Okay, I, I don't have the slide. Our, our uh, population also has grown. Population has grown by about 12 to 13 percent in the decade. On an average, uh, it has grown from somewhere uh, Okay, it's here. Sorry, population is here. Population growth. Uh, you see the power. The first part is population growth. If you see there, somewhere around uh, 10 or 10.9 percent in Bangladesh, 18.9 in Bhutan, 12.7 in India, 17.7 in Maldives, 11.6 in Nepal, Pakistan, 17.3. Of course, Sri Lanka has shown a very slow population growth of 5.3. But if you see the world average, it was 11.1 .1 in this decade. Now we have a population growth, more and more people wanting to enjoy their life, they, their economic condition is improving. That means our rate of consuming the resources will be increasing. It is not just the absolute value alone, the trend in consuming the resources is increasing. To that extent, the wage generation also is increasing. So this has to be addressed. If we are going to use more and more resources, at one point we'll see that we don't have resources to live. It is possible. You know, some of the resources are getting depleted. So how do we handle this? We need to address this issue from both the government angle as well as from the business angle. <clears throat> What are the issues that arise out of this population growth as well as economic growth uh, taking place together? <coughs> we have social and environmental issues arising out of it. All of you know about these things. Whenever a new project comes, we have displacement of people resulting in rehabilitation, resettlement, quite a lot of heartburns, in, especially with land acquisition and compensation. There are quite a few agitations and deaths social disparities, uh, it is not that whenever you have a project, project there, the whole society is going to prosper. A few will get jobs, a few will be left out. Now it results in some sort of heartburns because some people are becoming rich, some people have not progressed. There is going to be a social tension in the society. Now competitive demands for the resources. Now in society we want, say for example, water, for our drinking purposes, maybe for our household purposes, whereas a new project which has come up also requires the same water. It's, it's a, an issue which normally we call it as common property issue or multiple use issue. Yeah? So when there is a demand from both the project proponent or a project uh, factory and the society for the same resource, you are going to have conflicts especially when there is a scarcity of this resource. The other social issue which comes up is, uh, somebody pointed out, many times corporates are not transparent and true. 
when the project comes off, they give you a lot of promise. They say we are going to do so much of CSR activities. Later, the society realizes that they have not done anything on the CSR. So that means they have been cheated. So the society looks at most of these projects with suspicion. So there are many other social issues. We can go on listing them. But what I want to say is, whenever an economic growth takes place, when new projects come, social issues arise. There are also environmental issues. Especially we talk about new projects. Development is what? Development is about converting the resources, natural as well as uh, other resources, into products and services that are required for a better livelihood of the population. That's what is called uh, development. Whenever this development takes place, new projects come up. What happens is, in reality, when new projects come up, we are supposed to have what are called environmental impact assessments carried out. And these uh, reports are given to the decision makers to take decisions. Many times we find these are manipulated by the project proponents. It happened in quite a few cases. After the project was approved, the project has to be scrapped. I mean, already people have spent crores of rupees. Projects have, be, have to be scrapped because of this environmental reason. For example, there, there was a project on a power, power, power plant, thermal power plant which was given an approval, the project proponent had already spent 10,000 crores on the project. He had to abandon it because the land was a wetland. You know, wetland. All the people around agitated against this project. Four people died in shootout. Finally, the government decided that the project has to be scrapped. Now, the loss of 10,000 crores, which was, in, which was invested in this. Of course, we have a climate policy, but we also have to have energy intensive industry. So how do you man manage this? If energy, energy intensive industry comes up, our climate policy uh, uh, objectives may be affected. In countries like India, which, which are water starved, how are you going to handle water intensive industry like pep pepper and pulp? Are they going to affect the surrounding? So we have quite a lot of uh, products and uh, projects which cause pollution. Pollution affects the poor the more than the rich. So poor, poor are already poor. But now this pollution makes them much poorer. That can create a problem. Say for example, if they have to go for five kilometers to fetch a little water for the drinking purposes, is going to create problems. Most of the times, you know, this, this point was touched upon by quite a few speakers on products. Most of the times we don't bother about the products and their effects. And we also don't include the cost of product life cycle environmental impact in our calculations. There was a lot of discussion on cost of the sustainability, sust, uh, sustainability, sustainable products. I, I would call it environmentally sound products. Cost of, it's all high. It's not so. Most of the times, the cost is low. But when it comes to the market, the price is high because people are looking for niche markets. Because these products are normally, I mean, supposed to be efficient in their operations. If you see the total cost, the total cost, throughout the life cycle will be lower than the normal product. But we don't uh, no normally look at it. It can cause issues, especially at the end of life. See, we have so many cars on the road, so many TVs, so many electronic products, mobiles. What are we going to do with them at the end of life? They will all pile up. They will all add to our pollution. Have we factored in, when we designed these products, have we factored in what would be the cost of disposal? Have you factored in how we are going to distribute the cost? There are many issues which will come up when you go for development. And especially when our population is increasing, when people have affordability to buy products, you are going to have more and more problems coming up. <clears throat> so what is the imperative for the government? There are many things which the government can do. Normally, governments follow three paths. 
One is command and control. Command and control is issuing laws, acts, rules, maybe regulations and whatnot to regulate various issues that may end up in causing environmental impacts. Say, for example, water. The government may come out or it has come out with water regulation or water act, water pollution and control of pollution act. Maybe they have rules. They probably tell you, you cannot uh, discharge water with a uh, fluent water without treatment. If the water is treated, it has to meet certain regulations or certain standards. So this is the way, one way the government can control the pollution affecting people or the projects which come up which have some environmental impact affecting people. The second way is economic instruments. Some attempts have been made already in India on these things, like giving tax concessions for environmentally sound products, I mean, sound uh, projects, like solar energy. Solar products were, projects were given tax concessions, rebates, preferential purchases. Uh, this is one good thing where, you know, if the, if the country can say, okay, if you buy environmentally sound uh, products or if you put up environmentally uh, sound projects, we are going to help you economically. So that's a very good way of doing it. We, it's all well known. Quite a protocol or CDM is one such thing where you have an economic instrument to, to change your behavior. Accelerated depreciation is one such thing. There are many such uh, economic instruments available which the government can use to change the behavior of the business. Now the third one is volunteer initiative which has been touched upon, like promotion of ISO 14001, VOSAS 18001, initiatives of the supplier, you know. Government is the major purchasing agency. In the, any, most of these uh, countries, government is a major purchasing agency. If only they can influence their supplier, there can be quite a lot of improvement in the environmental condition around. So these are the three ways the government induces changes or controls the effect of environment on people and the surrounding. Now what the business can do? <clears throat> the business has to see that they are responsible towards all stakeholders, towards their customers, towards their investors, towards the government, towards their neighbors, I mean, even towards the environment. The environment also is a stakeholder. It cannot speak, but we have to take care of it. The, so whatever they can do beyond the law they have to do beyond the law to see how environment can be saved beyond the law how the society is not affected by the activities of this business beyond the the law to see that they improve the lives of people around of course compliance with the law is one of the major requirements going beyond the, beyond the law will help you better Sustainability initiatives can be, <coughs> you know, started with the suppliers. Because if you see more and more people are going for marketing, big companies going for, they are going for marketing, they are offloading the manufacturing. And most of the manufacturing is offloaded to small scalers. If you are going to offload to small scalers, you have more responsibility to see that these small scalers do their job the way you do otherwise in your own factories. If you probably have that philosophy, you will be doing a good job, you will not have a problem. Assume for a minute, you are not cared about your supplier and uh, the supplier has not bothered to comply with the law. What happens if he's closed? If he's closed, your supply chain is affected. If you are using his uh, piece part for your manufacturing, you have to close down your manufacturing. So it is in your interest here to see that the supplier meets all the requirements of law as well as he goes beyond the law to see that the, the environmental issues are taken care of. For example, if you have opportunities in the supplier's end to improve his energy efficiency, it is definitely going to improve your or reduce your cost. You can help the supplier to help you. <coughs> there are many companies which are given codes of conducts. These codes of conducts include quite a lot of uh, issues like say child labor, bribery, corruption, fair wages, there are so many. Like uh, we had a presentation about uh, one of the suppliers to the European Union. So 
most of these companies, big companies, who, who source their uh, products from here, they have these codes of conduct. If we follow the codes of conduct, most of the sustainability issues can be taken care of. In fact, uh, this gentleman uh, mentioned about this, that it has been helping them. Because this also will help them to be competitive. You are, whenever we talk about environmental management, we talk about efficiency improvement. How to use the resources the best possible way. The moment you improve the energy efficiency or you know, material efficiency or eco efficiency, you are Can you finish five minutes? Yes, sir. Before, before that. Thank you. Uh, if you are going to improve the efficiency of using the resources, you are going to be cost effective. You are going to be more competitive than others who do not bother about these environmental issues. So that will help the business. These are all imperatives for the business. They are necessary things. If they don't do it, probably in the long run they may not exist. As one of the CEOs said long ago, we have to bother about the environment. We don't bother about those who don't bother about the environment because anyway they are not going to be there. So if they don't bother about the environment today, they are not going to be there tomorrow. Why do we bother about them? Let us bother about the environment was his uh, words. And there are stricter demands. More than the code, there are companies which ask for uh, many more things. For example, if you are going to export to Europe, the requirement is you meet the requirement of ROHS. ROH is restriction on hazardous substances. If you are not aware of it, you are in trouble. If you are aware of it, if you are taking action, your products can go to Europe. Or maybe those who are exporting electronic or electrical goods to Europe should know what is WEEE. So it is not only complying with the law of the country that matters, it also is required that you know what is the law of the country to which you are exporting. If you are an export-oriented export uh, economy. These are a few issues I am not covering all. So what is the way forward? So what I told you was there is an economic growth in this region, there is a population growth in this region, both put pressure on the resources available to us and our uh, population should enjoy life. So they will be using quite a lot of resources in terms of products and services. When we go for this development, there is going to be, there are going to be issues, social issues, there are going to be environmental issues. We need to identify them, address them in a, in a fair manner. That is what is an imperative for the government and the business. If we do that, we will be able to sustain this economic growth. Economic growth which is taking place along with the population growth. Right? Now, what is the way forward? Our region has experienced high population as well as economic growth. In order to sustain the economic growth to meet the needs of ever-increasing population, our nations need to embrace sustainable development principles. I would say from whatever I have seen, each and every country in our region has adapted the, the sustainable development practices. Only thing is we have to see how they are implemented. Once we ensure the implementation part of it, Definitely, we will be able to probably sustain this economic growth with our population growth. Businesses should be partners in this effort by being responsible towards their stakeholders, including the society and the environment. Because business contributes, as I told you, about 60 to 80 percent of the GDP. So they have to really be a partner with the government in, in promoting sustainable growth, taking care of the environment and society. Finally, it is very important, even though we have been having a lot of discussion on this sustainability, people are, still have some uh, skepticism whether it is required for business. But if you really want sustainability in your region, if, as somebody said, you know, I think Professor Joe said, if people come from Europe and uh, United States and take this course, they always rate it very high. Because they have been made sensitive, they know what are the issues, sustainable uh, development issues. So they appreciate such courses, whereas uh, people from our region have not appreciated that so far. But it is imperative that the educators play an important role. Most of the issues arise out of awareness. You know, if awareness is not there, they tend to do things which are not sustainable. So awareness creation is, a, I would say, a major contribution towards 
sustainable development as educators, we can play an important role in that. Thank you very much. Okay.